bureaus worldwide. This is FSN. Thanks very much, Ollie Barrett. Thank you. It's Monday the 25th of February 2019. My name is Richie Allen. It's great to be back. How you doing? Hope you're well. It's a glorious day across the UK today. South Manchester basking in sunshine. What's going on? Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yes, it's great to be back. How you doing? Thanks for... For putting up with me. Thanks for the kind words and all of that, which I don't deserve. I'm back. I'm in a lot better health than I was in recent weeks. And I'm delighted to be back. Bored, witless I've been in the last few weeks. It is the Richie Allen Show. You can contact me right now on Twitter. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. You know that by now. There's something you'd like to tell me today about one of the stories I'll be covering. Just do so through Twitter. I'm so glad to be with you. It's your Richie Allen Show, live on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, TriggerWarning.tv, my own website, TuneIn Radio, and many other places as well. And it is Monday. It is gorgeous. It is glorious out there. It's amazingly beautiful today. It has been over the last uh, few days, as you'll know. And they're talking about records being broken in February. I'm sure there'll be one or two who'll put that down to, well, to climate change. Global warming. Although they don't say global warming anymore, do they? It's got nothing to do with climate change, but it's nice and pleasant anyway. Like a spring day today. Maybe we've seen off this winter, which wasn't too bad, apart from the snow we had. Well, I was properly sick with um, pneumonia. And it's not the first time in my life I had it. I had it when I was 15. And it saw me in Art Keane Hospital, Waterford Regional Hospital, when I was 15 for about seven weeks nearly a whole summer and um, the first 8 to 10 days was pretty terrible to be honest I don't know if you've ever had it or experienced it but it's so bad in the early stages that you'd willingly expire you'd be happy to close your eyes and not wake up it is that bad you know you cry at the thought of coughing because of the pains in your back it's like getting stabbed it's horrendous anyway a wretched experience and, you know, the best part of two and a half weeks before I was up and about and, you know, at least sitting up and watching a bit of telly and that. But um, I'm over it now. The unbelievable future Mrs. Allen at the same time had a very, very heavy flu and couldn't breathe either. It was a nightmare for her, feeling the way she was feeling and having to deal with me as well. But um, look, it's over and done with now. Um, I've had a rough time of it in the last six, seven months with a couple of things, but they're not related. I'm in great health. I'm fit. I'm strong. I've never smoked in my life. I'm careful about my fitness. I'm going to be fine. And I'm glad to be back. And I'm nobody important. I'm, I'm nobody at all, full stop. But to see the nice things that the people were sending through the website and nice messages and stuff like that did make me very emotional, it has to be said. And if I think about it now, I might get a bit emotional. I don't want to do that. So thanks for caring and for listening and for missing the show. I missed it just as much as you did, believe me. I was very amused now, must be said, sick as I was. But as I was getting a bit better, I was very amused sitting up in bed watching the coverage of the Jihadi Bride story. Shamima Begum. Brilliant stuff. And as I was watching bits of that, I I was thinking about you, to be honest. I thought... Well, anybody who's ever read my articles or listened to my boring monologues about how the news has replaced soap operas, afternoon, daytime soap operas in people's houses. Haven't I droned on about that for years? Please, Richie, you're not going to drone on about it now, are you? No, I'm not. But if you've read that stuff that I've done and if you've listened to any of those monologues, you'll know I thought you would have been laughing watching the hysterical coverage about this kid who was 15 who ran off with ISIS, but now wants to come back. Right? Pure theatre, and the masses, like the unquestioning rabble they are, fell for it hook, line and sinker. 
I think there was all over a week where every single radio show, every single talk and phone-in show were dealing with it. People screaming about Shamima. What a load of bollocks. And it's diversionary stuff, this. This is why they've replaced the daytime soap operas, the 24-hour news channels, so that they can serve up this sort of crap. The story is very real to the girl, the plonker who ran off to join ISIS, and everybody else. And of course there are people concerned about some of these people coming back home and being a danger, and I'm well aware of that. But the treatment of this story, Jesus, mad, huh? Lots going on, of course. Um, You might have noticed that the show has not, for the first time, not for the first time, made the national press. Last week, the Sunday newspapers and various Jewish publications, you might have seen, ran a story about Alex Scott Samuel, who's been on this programme with me, of course, several times. Alex is a one-time lecturer at Liverpool University in public health, right? And he was, until recently the chair of the Liverpool Wavertree Parliamentary Party. Until recently. Okay, Alex Scott Samuel. And that seat in Liverpool Wavertree is held by Luciana Berger, who won that seat as a Labour politician. But you'll know that very recently Berger, along with eight or nine other Labour MPs, chucka oo mana, and a few Tories left their party. So she's without a home, Luciana Berger, but she's sticking to, she's holding on to her seat. Anyway, look, she's Jewish, as you know, as is Alex Scott Samuel, importantly. And Alex Scott Samuel is a member of Jewish Voice for Labour, long-time guest on this programme, and he tabled a couple of no-confidence motions in Berger because of her attacks on Jeremy Corbyn. The Jewish Voice for Labour, by the way, just in case you don't know, supports Jeremy Corbyn. They're very much behind Corbyn and they reject this anti-Semitism allegation, the allegation that Corbyn himself is anti-Semitic or that Corbyn himself has got, you know, some sort of underlying problem with Jews. There are a lot of Jewish people who don't buy into that, the Jewish voice for Labour. So Alex Scott Samuel tabled no confidence motions in Berger because she was basically going after Corbyn. So the press has gone after Scott Samuel. And they've dug up an interview that I did with him back in 2017. Now, funnily enough, he was only on the programme as recently as about five weeks ago. You might remember. We talked about... What did we talk about then? The NHS, obviously, was it? can't remember, but he was on anyway. But they've dug up this interview that he did with me back in 2017... They've dug it up. And in that interview, the subject of the Rothschild dynasty came up. And neoliberalism, colonial wars, all of that. The Rothschild's mucky paws and fingerprints all over this sort of thing. And Alex was happy enough to talk about it. It was fairly harmless stuff. But the newspapers have hinted, of course, uh, they've not been stupid enough to print it outright, but they've hinted that because I've interviewed David Duke, Alison Chablow, Gilad Atzman, David Icke and others, they've hinted that this particular programme, your programme, is a safe space of sorts for those who hate Jews, which is bollocks, of course, of the monumental kind. Those interviews with David Duke and Gilad Atzman and and, and, and others, Alison Shablow, stand up to scrutiny. I repeatedly challenged them and argued with them and gave them shit and interrupted them. And Gilad Atzman has gone on the record as saying that the very first time he was interviewed by me, he said, and I quote, I thought Richie Allen was a captain in the Israeli Defence Force. He said it was brilliant that Richie was in agreement with much of what I was saying, but because there was no other side... Richie hammered me, which I did. And I hammered David Duke. There's very little I agree with, by the way, in terms of David Duke. So why am I telling you this? So this is a kind of a McCarthyism thing. McCarthyism is the best analogy. Look up Senator Joe McCarthy if you don't know what I'm talking about. That's the best analogy. It's anti-journalism. Forget about free speech for a minute. This is anti-journalism. It's anti, in my opinion anyway, everything that journalism is supposed to 
to stand for. And it's happened in a very quick space of time, this no-platforming thing. See, what the newspapers were saying, all of them, was that going on the Richie Allen show was indicative of Alex Scott Samuel's kind of anti-Semitic points of view, even though he's Jewish. I know the Jews are not Semites, I know. Because he was on the Richie Allen show, guilt by association because Allen has interviewed Holocaust deniers in the past. Now, when I tell you, dear listeners, that things were different 10 years ago, that's not bullshit. They were so different 10 years ago. Now, 10 years ago, I held the same opinion of Israel and Zionism as I do now. There was no, nothing different 10 years ago in what I was saying as opposed to what I say today. I was rootless, rootless, ruthless in my condemnation of the apartheid and racist, illegitimate state of Israel. Right? They don't like that, you see, Zionists, when you say illegitimate. It isn't legitimate. But anyway, they don't like it, right? But it's what I believe, and I'll always say what it is I believe. But even then, I had no problem getting hardcore Zionists like David Rubin to come on with me from Jerusalem and argue with me for a half an hour regularly. It was great radio, and it was important. Reuben was like, I know your positions. You're totally one-sided, Alan. You only see one side of it. You're pro-Palestinian, you're completely biased. But I'll come on your show anyway, because fair enough, you'll give me a hearing. That's the way it used to be. Great radio. I interviewed Abraham Foxman. Did you ever hear of him? Anti-Defamation League in New York. He was on my programme in Spain several times. And I argued with him at the time that the Anti-Defamation League was nothing but a bunch of witchfinder generals and that they were accusing people of hating Jews because of those people's opinions on Israel. It was good radio. Foxman was up for it. No problem. I'll come on and I'll argue with you. Fair enough. Grudging respect I have for such people even though I absolutely abhor, abhor what it is they stand for. But I appreciate it. They're balls. They're moxie. They're pith and vinegar. They'd have an argument with you. Fucking hell, marvellous. But the Witchfinder Generals are taking over the media now. The tabloids are very clever. They go just far enough, but they don't go too far. They didn't call me anti-Semitic or a Holocaust denier. They wouldn't because they'd be sued by me. They really would be sued by me. But they hinted at my guests and at my previous association with David Icke. Now, why David Icke hasn't sued the tabloid newspapers is anybody's guess. You would have to ask him. It's something, when I was, um, when I was connected to him, it's something I asked him time and time again. With your money, why don't you sue them? You will win. It's an open and shut case. But he always said that he would never sue because it doesn't bother him what they say and all that. But I don't believe that. That's not to be critical of David, by the way, at all. I don't believe him when he says that. Because they've had him kicked out of venues in the UK, they've had him banned from Australia, and they've repeated their libel time and time again. He isn't a Holocaust denier, yet he does nothing. I would. I would sue. And that's just the way it is. Right? Again, it's not, that's not a personal attack on David. David's reasons, or his stated reasons, for not suing are probably genuine. I don't know. But they wouldn't have me banned from Australia for calling me a Holocaust denier without me uh, seeking, not only seeking legal advice, but instructing a solicitor to instruct a barrister. These organisations have hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. And they've also got libel insurance that covers them for, again, hundreds of millions of pounds. Right? It's an outrage. The Australian Home Office can take somebody's visa away. It's tyranny. A lobby group claimed that Ike's presence would be harmful to Jews down under and he was banned. What a load of bollocks. Like I said, if a national newspaper or anyone with money libels me, it's important. Don't ever sue anybody that doesn't have any money. It'll be an expensive mistake. But if they've got loads of money, sue them. Sue the pants off them if they've libeled you. 
I've said it, I warned a Zionist group here last year who were about to call me stuff on Twitter and I said, please do. Next time we talk, it'll be in a court of law, in a civil court, and I will be taking you for hundreds of thousands of pounds. These are very dangerous times. Now, the last thing I'll say about the Richie Allen show is a Zionist group in this country is working very hard to find ways to stop me broadcasting. That's me, the Richie Allen show. They want to threaten those who host websites like mine, uh, threaten them to drop me. Or if they don't, they will be outed as supporting fake news sites or supporting safe spaces for Holocaust deniers. This is true. I know this to be true because I've been informed. Zionist groups have been in touch with the police up here. Thankfully, the police have told them to fuck off, basically. But they're looking for ways. How can we get these radio shows stopped full stop? So they've been lobbying the government to, quote, do something end quote, about these indie broadcasters. Do something. Do something. A writer for a well-known Jewish paper was in touch with a friend of mine recently, told my friend I was a racist and all the rest of it. My friend asked him for an example. The guy couldn't give one. My mate pointed out that my accountant is Jewish and that I am well-known to Jewish folks in the city. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Never let the truth get in the way of a good lie. I'm not going to stop telling what I believe to be the truth and I will never fear saying the Jews are not a biological race. The diaspora is a myth. It's a story. You're not born Jewish no more than you're born Christian. You are indoctrinated as I was when I was a child. Forced to make my first Holy Communion. Forced to make my confirmation. Indoctrination. I didn't have a choice. You're a Christian son. How would you like them apples? Well, I I don't know, really. Of course, when you get to 13, 14, you stop going and then you shed yourself of that label, of that indoctrination. Israel is an evil, racist, apartheid state run by Nazi thugs. Don't ever fear saying that. It's the truth. Why? Because the term Nazi entered our lexicon in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and they used the term Nazi to describe anybody who was fascistic, anybody who locked people up because they didn't like what they were saying. If the cap fits, wear it. Don't call Israelis Nazis just to wind them up. Don't be childish. Call it to them when it's appropriate. Benjamin Netanyahu is a Nazi thug. He is a crazy fucking psychopath who has corralled Palestinians into the biggest open-air prison in the world and instructs his soldiers whenever they're bored to take pot shots at them. That's Nazi behaviour. Don't be scared of it. Don't be apologising for your opinion. This is what the Zionist lobby wants. They want people like you and like me to begin every sentence. Well, look, I'm not anti-Semitic now, but don't do that. Don't apologise for what you know to be true. Don't ever do that. Don't apologise for asking questions about the percentage of the population and how Zionist Jews are overrepresented in public life, in journalism, the media and in film. Not just here, but in the US. And Zionists have bragged about it. Don't be scared of asking questions like that. It's not bigoted to ask that question. They make up less than 1% of the population. How are they so... Oh, And by they, I don't mean Jews. I mean Zionist Jews. Those who are members of the neighbour friends of Israel and this friends of Israel and that fr- friends of Israel. They've bragged about it. Gilad Arsman calls it Jewish power. Never be scared of talking about it. Never. And this is what the racist Zionists are terrified of. They're terrified of any discussion of why Jews are afforded such special treatment, why you can't speak about them or question them or criticise them and their ideology without being called racist, which is a misnomer, by the way. Jews are not a race. Why is a group of people, are they so exempted from criticism? No other identity group in the world enjoys anything like this level of protection. This is true, right? Right? Don't be scared of asking questions about that. It's not racist. By asking questions like that, you're not making an assumption that every Jew supports the state of Israel. I don't know any Jews who support Israel. 
This is true. And trade unionist friends of mine tell me that whenever there is a, a march organised by the Socialist Workers' Party, yeah, don't get me started on the Socialist Workers' Party, but anyway, whenever there's a march in Piccadilly in Manchester to, to try and raise awareness about the plight of Palestine, it is full, the protest and the meeting, of local Jews. Of course it is. The majority of Jews don't support the murder and wrongful imprisonment of the Palestinians, but the media doesn't want you to know that either. Right. And the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, has a yellow streak a mile wide on his back because he won't stand up to it. He won't say the very strong things I've just said. They're very strong, but they're very fair. He won't say those things. He won't stand up to it. And his best pal, John McDonald, the Shadow Chancellor, has turned on him now as well. Have a listen to the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, Tom Watson. Now, Watson was on the Andrew Marr show yesterday morning, you might have heard it. He's Labour's Deputy Leader. And Andrew Marr asked Watson, does Jeremy Corbyn need to change, does he? Of course Jeremy needs to understand that if we're going to be in number 10, he needs to change the Labour Party and there are things we need to do. I mean, firstly, we've got to eradicate anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish racism in all its forms. I mean, this week oh. I've had 50 complaints of anti-Semitism from my parliamentary colleagues uh, that I shared with Jeremy and for us to address that now, I think he needs to take a personal lead on examining those cases and, if necessary, recommending to our NEC what has to be done. You see, I think he would say, we, we, the reports that Lord Faulkner, who is a very senior figure in the Labour Party, a former Attorney General, um, has been put in charge of dealing with anti-Semitism in the party. Jeremy Corbyn has said again and again and again that he's hostile to anti-Semitism and lots of uh, cases have been heard by the Labour Party and disciplinary letters have been sent. I'm wondering what more he can really be expected to do. Well, he, he has said that it's not done in his name, but the problem is the test for us, the test for him as a leader, is to eradicate anti-Semitism and it's not other Labour Party members that will be the judge of that. It's the British Jewish community. And I think he understands now that if he is ever to be Prime Minister, he needs to rebuild that trust. And the way you do that, yes, Charlie Faulkner is a very important appointment that we get an independent scrutiny over that. But the way he will now have to do that is to review those cases and go to the NEC where he is in control. They will back him if he says these people need to be thrown out. And that's the only solution now because we, we, so he time is to, against he, us. He has to do it all himself. And look well, at these cases himself. I, I, I mean, I you've think, got cases, I think. I, I think the situation is so grave now that he understands he needs to t make a personal intervention. You know, we, we appointed a new general secretary who made it her priority to deal with it. I mean, very patently, um, the Jenny Formby reforms have not been adequate. They have not succeeded, and therefore it requires... Uh, a, a, another sort of push to try and make sure that, as John McDonald says, one case of anti-Semitism in our Labour Party is unacceptable and we need a zero-tolerance approach to that. But there's no such thing as anti-Semitism and it doesn't exist and none of these presenters are challenging uh, Tom Watson or anybody else to provide an example. Give us one of these examples. Tell us what was said that was so heinous that it needs to be rooted out of the party. It's just a nonsense. And of course, lefties, or left social democrats, let's not call them socialists because Corbyn is no socialist. Left social democrats believe that this is the establishment trying to destroy Jeremy Corbyn because Jeremy is such a threat to the establishment. There's nothing more laughable than that, as an idea. Jeremy Corbyn is no threat to the establishment. He is the establishment. He's sitting in Parliament because he swore an oath of allegiance to the Queen of England and all of her heirs. You know, this is the man who railed and campaigned against the tyrannical European Union from the back benches. Nothing's going to change. Those who pull the strings, who run the central banks, couldn't give a damn whether it's Corbyn or Tom Watson or Yvette Cooper who sits in the Labour leader's chair. They couldn't care less. Patricia tweets, Good evening, Patricia. Would it be wrong, Richie, to suggest that since the majority of media is Zionist controlled. The truth about what is happening in Gaza will never be made known to the masses. People have to do their own research to find the truth. Yes, Patricia, you're right. Now, back in 2015, or 2014, I should say, to, to be totally accurate, during the disgustingly 
um, named Operation Protective Edge when Israel was dropping bombs and killing hundreds and hundreds of children in Gaza. There was a little bit more criticism from the mainstream media than I'd seen previously in previous incursions into Gaza. But yeah, these days you don't get anything. You get a little bit of commentary on Russia today. Not a lot, though. You get a bit on press TV, but that was banned. You've got to go and look for press TV. But by and large, the media is not going to talk about what's happening in Gaza. It's as simple as that. And the media, for those of us old enough to remember, the difference between the media coverage of South Africa, when Mandela was still in prison, and the coverage of Gaza. You know, it's chalk and cheese, it's night and it's day. Let me tell you about free speech, uh, dear listener. When I was sick, you might remember this, when I was sick, uh, there, there was a story running about the government, the UK government, compelling social media companies to delete sites and channels and pages that have been deemed to be pushing fake news. I can't overstate how horrifying that is. They're going to appoint somebody or something, a body or a committee, to declare what is true and what is fake. And it won't just be social media that will be deleting pages and banning people. It won't just be YouTube. It won't just be Twitter and Facebook. Like I said earlier, they'll go after the website hosting companies and compel them not to carry sites that have been blacklisted. Mad times. I'll give you a right laugh, though. I'll give you a right laugh. When I was getting back on my feet a week ago, I got a, I got an email from YouTube. See, I didn't see any emails for two and a half weeks. And they said, we've deleted a show that you did a few weeks ago. And I went, well, which one was it? I looked at it and it was the one with Garodo Colmon and Jim Fetzer. They told me that I'd breached their guidelines on bullying, harassment and blah, 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 blah. But strangely enough, they reinstated the video and took the strike off my channel after I called them every name under the sun. What was funny about that was, in that interview with Jim Fetzer about his pending court case with Lenny Posner, I challenged Jim so much, and Jim didn't mind, Jim's very, a very smart man, that the comments under the video were as abusive as I've ever received. Made me laugh, actually. It's quite funny, because I, you know, went after Jim in the absence of any of the other side of the argument kind of a thing. But anyway, they put the video back on and said the strike has been taken away, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe they're messing with our heads. It's half five, by the way. This is the Richie Allen Show. Welcome back to it. I'm Richie Allen. 25th of February 2019. I've no idea how long this is going to last today. It's really tomorrow, Wednesday, tomorrow that I'm back with a proper show with interviews. Today... News roundup, just easing my way back into it. So it could last till five, a six, or it could last till half six. It probably will go to half six, I think. I don't know. So I'm just kind of, you know, letting you know where we are. 29 minutes to six it is now. Bit of Brexit then, anyone? Anyone a bit of Brexit? Bit of Brexit? The UK Prime Minister says that she remains focused on leaving the European Union on the 29th of March, which is... A little over a month away. I remain focused on leaving the European Union. Now this is despite the fact that she is being bombarded from every side by people who want a delay. Delay Brexit. Temporarily suspend Article Article 50 there. Keep us in for a while. We need a bit more time. This is what's happening. The Yvette Cooper Amendment. Even Tories. A hundred Tories apparently want a, a, a Brexit today, apparently, if you believe that. Anyway, May said she felt a real determination from EU leaders in recent days to find a smooth and orderly path to a deal. The Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte warned her that the UK was sleepwalking into a no-deal scenario and that we all needed to wake up. Fuck off, Mark Rutte. Anyway, May admitted there was much more to do... It's all been kicking off today. They're in Egypt, aren't they? Sharm El Sheikh. They're at the EU League of Arab States Summit. They're all there. Merkel, Donald Tusk. Now, Donald Tusk is the European Council President. He's delighted and he's pretty sure that Article 50 will be delayed, meaning we ain't going anywhere. This is Donald Tusk. I can say, first of all, that Prime Minister May and I 
discussed yesterday a lot of issues, uh, including <coughs> the legal and procedural context of a potential extension. It's, for me, it's absolutely clear that there is no majority in the House of Commons to approve a deal. We will face an alternative, a chaotic Brexit or extension. I believe that in the situation we are in, an extension would be a rational uh, solution. But Prime Minister May uh, still believes <coughs> that, uh, that she's able to avoid this scenario. Yeah. What was Theresa May's response to that? Here she is. What we're working for is to deliver uh, what Parliament asked us to do, which was to address the issue that they have a concern about in relation to the backstop. Uh, we're doing that. We're working with the European Union on that, with the Commission. We've had constructive meetings over the last week. Uh, my team will be back in Brussels tomorrow, continuing those discussions. As I say, I believe it is within our grasp to leave with a deal on the 29th of March. And I think that's where all our energies should be focused. Uh, any delay is a delay. It doesn't address the issue. It doesn't resolve the issue. I think there is as I say, the opportunity to leave with a deal on the 29th of March, and that's what we're going to be working on. Mm. But Labour and Tory Europhiles, you see, are going to get their way and destroy May by taking no deal out of her hands. And the Yvette Cooper amendment this week... Meek? Meek? The Yvette Cooper amendment this week will see the country move closer to officially delaying Brexit by temporarily... Yeah, right... Uh, delaying the exit date for a few months. This is going to happen this week. Now, on the no deal thing, Bernard Jenkins is a Tory MP. He's a big Eurosceptic. He's a, he's a supporter of the group Leave Means Leave. And he was on Sky News this morning with Adam Bolton and he had a rather testy exchange with Adam Bunter Bolton. We'll have a brief chat about it after we have a listen. Do you want to hear it? Bernard Jenkins is asked by Adam Bolton... What about delaying Brexit? I think it would be uh, disastrous yeah. if we had a delay. Yeah. Um, I think the faith in our politics would, what, what faith is left well, of it, would evaporate. Absolutely. So, so, so all so I'm we'll, saying is in that case, why not come on board with Mrs May? Well, um, you're quite right to run through all the dilemmas that uh, we're all facing at this particular moment. But what we shouldn't yeah, but it's do... it's not just a parliamentary but what game, we it's the future of the country that's at stake It here. is, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, I take that very seriously. But what we shouldn't do now is take no deal off the table, which is what a whole lot of people who want to stop Brexit are going to try and do this week. And I come back to the point, you are prepared to say to your constituents in 32 days, we leave with no deal. I'm prepared to... If, if the deal remains completely unacceptable, uh, that may be the only option. But the alternative would be the whole of the United Kingdom, mm. effectively, to accept defeat. And you would defeat. prefer that option uh, to what is currently the agreement between the UK government and the European Union. You um, would prefer... Uh, and the no reason is, exit. yes, and the reason is, at the moment you can leave the European Union on two years' notice, you can, we can walk out of NATO, Norway can break their Norway agreement with the EU at one year's notice, yeah. uh, we can leave the UN, we are being asked to sign up yeah. to something where there is no legal exit. Do you think any of those things and are I, a good idea? Um, uh, I think we should... Leaving the UN, leaving NATO? No, of course. What a, what a shithead Adam Bolton is. What a disgusting shithead. A third of a man. Not a third of a man, not 33% of a man. A third of a man. An arsehole of a man. He wasn't suggesting that we should leave NATO, Bernard Jenkins. He was making the point that if we want to leave NATO, we'll just be able to do it. Walk out. But with the deal that May has, we'll be trapped in the backstop forever and ever. And we wouldn't be able to get out of it. As it stands, the UK would be trapped in a ludicrous backstop and by, by definition then stuck in a customs union with the European Union. We wouldn't be leaving. That's why Bernard Jenkins voted against Theresa May's deal. Because it ain't leaving. Adam Bolton is just a disgusting shithead. It's crap journalism that. Anyway, the interview got a little bit testier here. Have a listen here. That You're is the principle. to plunge Britain into a no-deal Brexit when you say in 32 days' plunge time. Plunge is your word. Plunge is the scare story word. Well, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's it, a big it, development. Uh, and, and, it, it, it's, a, it's a big change, but the British people voted to leave. They didn't vote. So you're prepared no. for that, whether, whether you think it's going to be if it is necessary, If it is necessary, then we must do it. And indeed, the advantages would be the uncertainty would be over very much more quickly. Well, it would be the uncertainty of hitting yourself on the head with a brick, perhaps. Well, uh, the uncertainty, no, that's your scare stories. 
uh, it's, uh, you know, this will be far less damaging than, for example, being in the ERM or if we join the euro. Look what's happened to some countries who are in the euro. Um, that's not going to happen to us. It's not going to be like the, moment, it's not going to be like the banking crisis. Where the whole okay. uh, you know, system goes into a melting pot, and we so you don't think there'll be turbulence. I, you don't think no. no? I think all it's right. all been vastly okay. overhyped. Well, even your colleagues and in the ERG disagree on that one. Well, uh, well, do they? Yes, uh, I don't they sat they, here and told me there'll be turbulence. Oh, there, there will be. It's not. It's not going to be an easy ride. I'm not saying it's it, going to be plain what's sailing. What's the point of it? Um, the point is to deliver the dem democratic decision taken by the British people. Yeah, brilliant there how he highlighted the buffoonery of Bolton, scaremongering, you know, using terms like plunge, plunge the country into no deal and all that. That's what the media's been doing. Told you about Brexit was never going to happen. Told you two and a half years ago, never. And when Luciana Berger and Anna Thubri and Chuka O Munna left their parties, it had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. It was to stop Brexit. It's as simple as that. And taking no deal off the table is beyond ridiculous because you are cutting the legs out from under the negotiator. No matter what the deal is about, dear listener, if you take away the option of washing your hands and walking away, you're screwing your negotiator. Why would you do that? Well, I tell you why. Because a deal, and those two words that we hear all the time, a deal, we must get a deal, a deal, a deal, a deal, a deal. Do you know what a deal means? A deal means staying in the European Union or Brexit in name only. That's what a deal means. And this is your Richie Allen Show for Monday, February 25th, 2019. Some of you will be happy to know we're going to leave Brexit behind. Lots to talk about in the next 45 minutes or thereabouts. Stay with me. I will read a few tweets when I come back. It's the Richie Allen Show on Fab Radio 2. Triggerwarning.tv, tune in radio and richieallen.co.uk. My name is Richie Allen, great to be back. And this is the brilliant cult and she sells sanctuary back in three. Music from the cult on the Richie Allen show, she sells sanctuary. The time approaching 17 minutes to the top of the hour. If you've got 10 minutes to be there, you've probably still got time to get there. You'll make it. Ah, the traffic must be mad. The kids back to school today. Last week was half term. I imagine the roads are crazy out there. I should have a helicopter up there, shouldn't I? If this was a radio show, radio show even worse, it's salt. You'd have a, you'd have a copter. You'd have a chopper up there, high in the sky, looking down on Princess Road, Deansgate. Marvelous, Salford. Right, that was the cult and. Um, you know what we should do? Corbyn, some of you are tweeting the Labour Party is going to officially support a second referendum. It will, of course. Uh, I told you about Corbyn. I told you what he was like when he became leader of the Labour Party. I told you that he wasn't the saviour of socialism. I told you what he was like. I take no pleasure now in saying I was right and you were wrong. When I say you, I mean those of you who bombarded me to say, give me a chance, give me a chance, Richie. He must be good, they're so determined to get rid of him. It's all theatre, you see, dear. It's theatre. It doesn't mean anything. But on the, the last thing I'm going to say about Zionism today, maybe we should just give in to them, you know? Maybe we should just give in. I was thinking the other day, the way things are going, in future, when you attend a christening, the godparents are going to be asked, instead of just being asked, do you swear that if anything happens to the parents, that you will look after the children? The godparents are often asked about, you know, making sure the child follows the religious education and all of that. Eventually, they're going to start asking godparents at christenings, will you make sure that the child knows all there is to know about the Holocaust? Will you make sure that the child knows that six million Jews were murdered in Germany and that you can't say this and you can't say that about Jewish folk? That's where we're going with it. So maybe we should just give in, really. Just give in and just laugh at it, you know, because that's all you can do is laugh. It's an interesting story that got a lot of coverage today. Primary school children are going to be taught about gay and transgender relationships from the age of five under a new curriculum. The details of this were published today. 
It made a lot of the Sunday newspapers yesterday, this. Primary school children from the age of five will be taught about uh, these subjects uh, as part of compulsory lessons. Parents won't get a say in whether or not these uh, their children are present for these lessons. The guidance was rolled out today. Uh, the guidance, excuse me, was published today. These lessons will be rolled out next year. And what's going to happen in 2020 is that parents' right to remove their children from sex education will cease. So from 2020, if you don't want your child to be educated about sex in school, there won't be a damn thing you can do about it because your uh, right to withdraw will disappear, right? So parents won't be able to opt their children out something they can do at the moment. This is announced by Damien Hines today. He's the Education Secretary. It has pissed a lot of people off. And I believe there are petitions online with 100,000 signatures uh, to stop this. And, yeah, well, we've talked about this before, haven't we? Lots of discussion about it today. Before we hear a couple of so-called experts talking about it, let's hear a Vox Pop. We've not heard of Vox Pop for a while. I'd like to do them myself, but I don't have the time. And it's just me here working on the Richie Allen Show. I don't have anybody to do Vox Pops. A Vox Pop is basically when a journalist, a reporter, goes out into a town centre usually and asks a bunch of people the same question. Right? And So you try and get a, a flavour of what people are thinking. So you've got one question, it doesn't change. And you ask, um, when I was doing Vox Pops years ago, I would usually ask about a dozen people or thereabouts. And then I would edit the answers together. No selective editing. I would just do it the way it came to me. I would make tidy it up, make it nice and sharp and put it out. So the BBC did a Vox Pop. They sent people or they sent a reporter into Salford, the city of Salford, to ask people, do you agree or disagree with five-year-olds being taught about sex and about same-sex relationships and gender identity and stuff like that. This is what the people of Salford told the BBC. I think being a parent myself, it's a little bit too young as, you know, they're still children and really innocent at that age and I don't think that they really would understand anyway to be told that. I think it's maybe a good thing for the future, but at like four, it's a little bit too young. I think... It depends, really. It's better that they're learning from a younger age so they know what to expect when they're growing up so they don't outcast other people. So I, I think it's a good idea, me. I think the younger, the better. they got more time to grow and understand it more. It should be compulsory. Everyone should know it, but I just don't think it should be taught from such a young age falls too soon. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea because I think children should know just in case so they know like what to look out for and if anyone says anything inappropriate they should be able to know what that means, be able to speak to the parents, speak to teachers and feel comfortable about it. I think four's a little bit young and I'd say it's more for the, the parents to, yeah, that to discuss it with your own child because you, you want to know what they're being taught and they're not going to you know, speak to all the parents. I think it's up to the parents as well what they teach them at that age. Hmm. The BBC, uh, well, it's fairly miserable, that. It's shoddy journalism and dishonesty by the BBC. They've deliberately edited the Vox Pop to make it look like those who took part are split 50-50. I would be amazed if that was true, if they spoke to a dozen or 15 people I would be stunned if it, well, 15 is obviously a number that you can't split, uh, in terms of people anyway, uh, seven and a half, I know, yeah, but you can't split 15 people into two equal groups. Um, what they should do is tell the truth. They should say, well, we spoke to 15 people and th- 10 said yes, it's okay, or not, or whatever, but they don't. They give you this bullshit balance uh, brainwashing thing. They edit the Vox Pop to make it sound like it's kind of split down the middle. Well, Sky News had a debate uh, today. Antonia Tully is, uh, she represents the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. And she went up against a woman called, and uh, no, let me get this right now. Yeah, Antonia Tully represents the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. And Liat Hughes-Joshi, 
Liat Hughes Joshi is a children's author. Now, Liat Joshi Hughes, actually, Jesus Christ, Richie. Liat Joshi Hughes is very concerned about outdated parents giving outdated views or advice to children. This is very big brother and very sinister, this. Listen to Liat Joshi Hughes. But there are a slightly larger number of cases where the very parents who want to take their children out of these sorts of lessons are the ones whose children need them the most. The ones who will be giving their children outdated and frankly backward ideas about sexuality and about certain practices. And I just don't want that to be happening to children in our society now. Equally, I am a mother to a teenager and I really would not want my my son at school to be seeing completely graphic or inappropriate uh, material and I think you know we do have to as I say draw a line keep it sensible but I don't think that parents should be allowed to take their children out of these sorts of lessons because they are the very ones whose children need them Wow Wow now, Antonia Tully is not impressed. She's the lady from the Society for Protection of Unborn Children. She's not impressed with that at all. Well, I think that's a dreadful view of parents. I think most modern parents are perfectly capable of talking to their children about these issues. They want to. And it's just this constant undermining of parents. And, um, I, I, you know, this, the, all we're asking for is to let parents withdraw their children and not have this draconian um, state invasion into families family life saying your children must have these lessons. Uh, parents must have the right to be able to pass on their own views and values about human sexuality, marriage, the family. So let parents withdraw their children please. That's what we're asking the government. Zulian so, 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 talking about views, values, you talked about outdated ideas. I mean this this is about how people regard sexuality, isn't it? And it's about sexuality's place in society. These are different, these are things that people do have different views upon and about. Uh, it isn't necessarily just teaching biology. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah. th th you know th there will be parents who will, will fundamentally disagree with a lot of the teaching that might be uh, trendy teaching at the moment, or it might be modern teaching at the moment, but they may fundamentally feel why should their children be exposed to that? Very, very good Sky News woman. Great question from the presenter. First of all, Antonia Tully was very eloquent. It is draconian. It is dangerous to be saying things like, you know, uh, outdated views are being taught by parents. We can't have that. So we've got to take the children out of that situation in terms of we should get the schools to do it to counter these outdated views that the parents have. Antonia Tully was very good, but it was a great question the presenter asked the progressive children's author. Why should parents agree to their kids being exposed to some, something they are fundamentally opposed to just because it's trendy now? What did Liat Joshi Hughes say? I accept that in some situations, some teachers, frankly, are taking things too far with the subject matter and one of the things that I would say about the guidelines that have come out today is that I would actually like to see them be more prescriptive not leaving it down to individual teachers uh, to decide but I'm not, I just want to go back to Antonia's point suggesting that I think parents as a whole are not capable of having these discussions Thank I'm not so. saying that the majority of parents aren't capable of having these discussions and actually parents play a really really important role in, in sex and relationships education undoubtedly but what I am saying is there is a small group in our society who continue to teach children uh, ideas that are completely backward and inappropriate. And I think schools genuinely do have a role and the curriculum has a role to play in countering that. Antonia, your response? Sorry, I know you did lose your earpiece during that. But yes, thank you for battling onwards. Um, well, who's deciding who these parents are yeah. who are backward? Um, and, you know, we, we've got this measure that's going to affect every single school in the country. And we feel that parents, the vast majority of 
whom are sensible, caring parents, and we just want parents to be able to have a say in this new subject. And if they don't like what schools are teaching, then let them withdraw their children. Um, we want schools to, to consult parents, we want schools to engage with, with parents, and vice versa. And so why do we have to have it as a compulsory subject? We want parents to be able to decide what is going to suit their children best. Very good stuff uh, from the Sky News presenter and from Antonio Tully. Leave them alone. Now, I'm not going to go into the areas that we've gotten into before. I'm not going to repeat myself about what the agenda is behind this, what is really going on here, because even the head teachers at these schools, even the teachers themselves, will not know what this is really all about. I'm going to leave it there because I think you have an idea. It's four minutes to the top of the hour. I'm going to take another tune so I can catch my breath. I'm going to have some water. When we come back, we'll talk about Venezuela. And there are loads of comments to read. I'm going to read them. I really am. After a bit of music. I saw the Queen biopic a few weeks ago, didn't I? Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. With um, this guy Malik who won Best Actor last night at the Oscars for his portrayal of Freddie Mercury. A lot of Queen fans are cheesed off because a lot of, a lot of there's a, a lot of artistic license in the film. You know, in terms of things not happening in sequence, things not happening at all, and all the rest of it. The general consensus seems to be that the guy who plays Freddie Mercury, Malik, why can't I think of his name? It must be... I'm still kind of half, um, you know, drugged up with the drugs I was on when I was sick. Maybe that's it. I can't think of his name. But anyway, he won Best Actor. The film is, the film is not bad. We enjoyed the, the film, Carlin and myself, when we watched it. So I'm going to play some Queen. I'm going to have a bit of a breather. When we come back, I'll read some comments. Maybe we'll, uh, ha maybe we'll hear the headlines. Uh, we'll hear the headlines maybe when I come back. We'll play. I'll read some comments then. And I want to talk about Venezuela. And uh, got some interesting things for you to listen to about Venezuela. Uh, this is The Amazing Queen and one of the greatest tunes of all time, right? Yeah, if a radio presenter interrupts it in any way, from start to finish, they should be fired. Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, on the Richie Allen Show, three minutes past six. Before we read some of the tweets, um, I suppose we can pop over to FSN, have a little listen to the headlines. Has anything changed? Has anything changed at all since we last heard from Ollie Barrett in London? Uh, let's find out. This is FSN 30 Second Headlines. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Ollie Barrett. US envoy Zalmay Khalilzad met one of the co-founders of the Taliban as a new round of peace talks begin in Qatar. President Donald Trump's announced the US will delay imposing more tariffs on Chinese goods. UK Prime Minister Theresa May says there's been good progress in Brexit talks with EU leaders in Egypt. And the 91st Academy Awards in Hollywood saw the most prestigious prize Best Picture going to an unexpected winner. Green Book. Thanks very much, Ollie. It's uh, the Richie Allen Show approaching five minutes past six for Monday, 25th of February 2019. Going to be with you till around about 6 30 today. Don't worry. The show is back. I'll be back with you for two hours tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. I'm loaded with guests this week. It is your Richie Allen Show. There is none like it. Thanks for choosing it. Going to be reading some of your comments now in a second, and then we'll have a little chat about Venezuela, you and I. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Now, somebody is tweeting on a hoax account called the Yorkshire Friends of Israel. And some of my listeners, whom I thought knew better and could spot a hoax, have fallen for it hook, line and sinker and are debating somebody with nine followers who claims that he offers anti-Semitism courses for people who are anti-Semitic to go and to be re-educated, at which point they will be given a certificate to say they are no longer anti-Semitic. And some of my listeners actually believe this bullshit. Don't be so naive, there are troll accounts everywhere. I wouldn't be surprised if the Yorkshire Friends of Israel is none other than my friend Hayden Hewitt. It's the sort of thing Hayden would do, to be honest. <laughs> Even if it is him, he wouldn't admit it. Anyway, loads of comments. Hi to Diane. How you doing, Diane? 
in Waterford. Well, she's not far from Waterford, Diane. Diane says that she wouldn't have a child in school. End of story. This is something I've said a few times myself. If we were blessed with children, we would undertake the schooling of our children for the very reasons outlined in the last segment of the programme. Hi to Martin in Spain. How you doing, Martin? Uh, in this together. Hi to Susan. Uh, hi to Mark. How you doing, Mark? That's Mark Ant, by the way. Spirit Samba there. Uh, to Delroy. How you doing, Delroy? Richie, I don't know how America gets away with it in Venezuela. It's so criminal. It is, Delroy. But of course, the reporting on it in the newspapers in this country and elsewhere, well, the reporting on it is all very similar. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute without repeating myself, without boring you. We'll talk about what's going on. Abby Martin, the journalist, um, some of you will have heard of her, used to do uh, a bit for RT in the past. Has done a very good um, bit of reporting on Venezuela to give her 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 due, to give her her credit. And I'll talk about that. She interviewed somebody very interesting and I'll bring you a little bit of that in a minute. Um, Loads of comments on various issues there. Uh, Rich tweets, Richie, have you clocked this 900 quid course being offered? Yeah, this is this is people falling for this bullshitter claiming to be the Yorkshire Friends of Israel. There is no Yorkshire Friends of Israel. I don't mind it. Nonsense. There's the North West Friends of Israel, all right. Zionist group in the, in the North West. Bunch of morons. David Stanford tweets, Richie, if Freddie Mercury was heterosexual, are we in any doubt that an Oscar would not have been bestowed? I don't know, David. That might be a bit harsh. I thought the kid was very good in the film. Although I did read an article in the Sunday Telegraph that said, not in the Sunday Telegraph, in the Telegraph today, that said that the guy's performance of Mercury was rubbish. I, I don't go along with that. I, I thought he was, um, I thought he was good. Hi to Patrick Vidian. Yeah, Diane was saying I would take my child out of school altogether. Main steam education is pretty dire. Anyway, I wonder how much more difficult it's going to become in the near future to homeschool. Is that going to become more difficult to do than it has been previously? My old friend Aaron Callan, I told you about Aaron, mentioned Aaron a few times, good lad, and his wife Vicky, lovely woman, went to visit him in Bury uh, and saw them educating their young children. And the children were very bright and very smart and they were reading various books. And they were doing art projects and they were asking questions of their parents. And I thought, brilliant stuff. Very impressed with Aaron. I came away very moved that day, having watched it in action. You know, because I'd never seen it before. I'd never been in a house where the child was homeschooled. A part of you thinks you'll go in there and there'll be nappies piled up in the corner. <laughs> there'll be absolute mayhem. There'll be a Thomas the Tank engine stuck to the wallpaper and you won't be able to get it off unless you use a grenade. That's the sort of thing you think. And then I went in there, and the children were brilliant. I mean, smart children, you know, asking me questions and stuff. They were like five and six years old, the kids. Brilliant comment from David Stanford. Just keep your child out of school on the day they are teaching sex education and tell them they are protesting climate change. Seems to be okay for everyone else. Brilliant comment, David. That's so far... The Sky Sports uh, Super Sunday Man of the Match Comment Award that. That's right. I did see that when I was sick. The children were taking a day off school to protest climate change. Holy Jesus, I thought. I thought, holy Jesus. I also noticed a story about a woman who was having an argument with a trans man or a trans woman on Twitter. The woman in question said, I will never believe you are a real woman. And she was arrested and kept in a holding cell for seven hours. Did you read that story? It was, not only was it in the mail, but it was in the sun and the mirror and everything else. Oh, sure, this is not a tyranny at all, you know. She had a go at somebody on Twitter and said, you're not really a woman. Next thing she finds that, well, she's in a holding cell. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Please. <laughs> What would you do if they came to you and said, tell you what, pal, uh, saw you on Twitter there. You told a trans person you didn't think they were a real woman. We're going to bring you down to the station for a bit of a chat. All you know? right, move on. Nothing to see here. Please, this Nothing to see here. Please. Please. Nothing to see here. 
Where was the outcry in Parliament about that? You know, we should be marching in the streets about that. She made a comment on Twitter and you kept her in a holding cell for seven hours. You know, if it was me, if it was my wife, you see, if I say what I want to say now, I'll get arrested. If it was my wife, I'd blow up the fucking police station. Of course, I wouldn't really, because I don't know anything about explosives or ammunition or anything like that. And I wouldn't harm a hair on anybody's head, not for something like that. But it would drive you mad, eh? Seven hours in jail because you said to somebody you're not really a man, you know, or you're not really a woman, you know? What kind of fuckery is this? Ah, plain old fuckery, Amy. Plain old fuckery indeed. Hi to Mawinga, did I say hi to Mawinga? Did I say hi to at of Argyle, my friend, cartoon drunk David? How you doing, pal? If I've not said hello to you today, by the way, do not be offended. There's been a lot of tweets, maybe more tweets than there are usually. I think maybe one or two of you missed me. You don't want to admit it, do you? But I think you did miss me a little bit, I think. I missed you as well. How you doing to Christy? Uh, how you doing, Christy, as well? Patricia Brownsfire, how you doing, Patricia? Brilliant to hear from you all the way from um, Zurich, of course. Uh, to David Hart as well. Uh, those of you who fell for this Yorkshire Friends of Israel tweet or go to the stupid corner... Stand there for about three minutes until um, we tell you you can come back to your seat. Fucking <laughs> bonkers. Right, let's talk a little bit about Venezuela then. This Monday, why not? Venezuela. Venezuela. Now, the media. That's the mainstream media. What's the media saying about Venezuela 24-7? Well, they're saying that Nicolas Maduro is a brutal dictator and that he's starving his people to death. What a bastard, eh? Imagine. He stole the election. Widespread fraud. He locked up the opposition. Now that is the spin on your news channel of choice. There isn't the news channel that's challenging that. They're all saying it. It's a coup, of course, against Venezuela. And I even read... And I think it, it was backed up that social media, in the guise of Twitter and Facebook, have been deleting pro Maduro accounts. Did you see that? Hundreds and hundreds of pro Maduro accounts have been deleted. Welcome to 1984. No surprise, of course, that's what they were set up to do, Facebook and Twitter. Donald Trump sent aid using US military aircraft. That big, useless-haired fucking buffoon Trump. Weaponizing aid. Concerts by Richard Branson, eh? Richard Branson. Isn't he Jeffrey Epstein's friend? Prince Andrew. Yeah. Wonderful what's going on. The US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has been ramping up the rhetoric on Fox News. We're going to go in there. We're going to do whatever it takes uh, to get rid of Maduro. This is the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. In a statement at the end of yesterday, you said... He's being asked the question. You will first hear the presenter, then you'll hear Pompeo. You said the United States will take action. What does that mean? We've already taken action. Action to support the Venezuelan people. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, they have a duly elected interim president, Mr. Guaido. We're going to continue to support him. We'll continue. The American people have been most generous, providing a couple of hundred tons of food, medicine, hygiene kits for the Venezuelan people. And then we'll continue to build out the global coalition to put, to put force behind the voice of the Venezuelan people. What's happened there is a tragedy. There were uh, five or six or eight killed yesterday, um, but there have been hundreds and hundreds killed from starvation over the past weeks and months. Millions of people having to flee their homes. Three million people have had to leave. Ten percent of the Venezuelan population. Uh, but, bullshit. But anyway. Venezuelan population. That, those are the actions of the American people and the Trump administration to support democracy in Venezuela. But no military force. We've said every option's on the table. We're going to do the things that need to be done to make sure that the Venezuelan people's voice, that democracy reigns, and that there's a brighter future for the people of Venezuela. All right. If the United States military attacks Venezuela, the Chinese, the Iranians, well, the Iranians can't, sadly. The Chinese and the Russians should nuke the United States off the face of the earth. Now, of course, that's just me being angry. I don't want to see that. 
I don't want to see the already beleaguered American people who suffer just as much, in a way, as everybody else. I don't want to see anybody killed. But I'd like China to threaten the United States, you know. I'll tell you what, if you go into Venezuela and turn it into Libya or Iraq, we will fucking rain hellfire and damnation down on California. I'm fucking telling you. But of course they won't. Nothing will happen. The United States will do what the United States wants to do. And that's the way it is. Sadly. Isn't it? So what's the truth then about what's going on? The journalist Abby Martin has done a good job in explaining to her own audience just what's been going on in Venezuela. Good for her. She interviewed, and it's a very good interview and it's a very important interview, the very first United Nations investigator to visit Venezuela in over 20 years. His name is Alfred Dezeus. Alfred Dezeus. He was in Venezuela very, very recently and again, it's got to be pointed out, the first investigator in the country for over 20 years. Now, he's horrified that the Western media hasn't broadcast or written about his findings. Here he is in conversation with Abby Martin. So what about the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela? Listen to UN investigator Alfred Dezeus. If you know a humanitarian crisis in Gaza and in Yemen and in Syria and mm. in Sudan and in Somalia, you wouldn't say there is a humanitarian crisis uh, in Venezuela. And at no point when I was walking the streets in Venezuela did I feel uh, threatened or did I see violence or did I uh, consider that this country was undergoing a humanitarian crisis. But uh, I see human rights more and more being instrumentalized to destroy human rights. There is a weaponization of human rights. I see the rule of law being instrumentalized to destroy the rule of law. And unfortunately, the complicity of the mainstream media. What I'm saying to you, I think it would have been sensible to say it to the BBC. It would have been sensible to say it to the New York Times and to the Washington Post and to The Economist and to the Financial Times. But uh, at no time since I returned from Venezuela and since my report was officially presented to the Human Rights Council, have I been approached by any of these uh, organs who actually have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis you and vis-a-vis -vis me and vis-a-vis -vis the people of the United States to inform. But they buried his report. Okay, and Abby Martin dug this guy out and put him on, on her programme, which is a brilliant thing to do. The media buried his report. <laughs> his report says, well, no, things are not like that at all in Venezuela. It's all right, really. Of course there's problems. But things are okay, largely, and the problems haven't been created by Maduro. So what happened to Venezuela then? He's brilliant here. Alfred Dezeus, UN investigator. Now this is three minutes long, so you've got to focus, you've got to concentrate on what he says, because he beautifully explains what has happened to Venezuela. Three minutes long. It'll be the best three minutes you spend today. Listen to this. From the mouth of the United Nations itself, Alfred Dezeus. What I told uh, the uh, Human Rights Council uh, is that the financial blockade has had uh, extremely adverse human rights impacts. Obviously, the origin of the current economic crisis is in the fall, the dramatic fall in the price of oil. But uh, normally, you would be able to fix that. Uh, a country as wealthy as Venezuela should have been able uh, to borrow money uh, on its enormous natural resources and uh, then would have been able to buy and sell like anybody else. But no, uh, the United States has made sure that uh, because of the threat of enormous penalties to the U.S. Treasury, 
uh, the banks have been closing the accounts of uh, the Venezuelan government and of the uh, Petróleos of Venezuela. Already in July uh, 2017, uh, Citibank unexpectedly decided without prior notice and arbitrarily to close the bank accounts of the Central Bank of Venezuela and the Bank of Venezuela in November 2017. Uh, again, uh, Citibank uh, blocked uh, the uh, transfer uh, for a shipment of more than 300,000 doses uh, of insulin. In November 2017, the company Euroclear retained $1.65 billion that the Venezuelan government had paid for the purpose uh, for the purchase of food and medicine. Uh, CITCO, the uh, uh, Venezuelan state oil company based in the U.S. has not been able to transfer its profits outside the United States of America. It needs that money to buy mm -hmm. food and medicine. And it is in the neighborhood, I think, by now of nine or uh, ten billion uh, dollars that have been withheld. There again, Wells Fargo Bank uh, withheld and canceled payment of seven million five hundred thousand made by Brazil to Venezuela uh, for the sale of electricity. In May 2018, the Venezuelan Minister of People's Power uh, informed that a financial transaction amounting to seven million dollars for the purchase of dialysis supplies for patients, including children and adolescents, uh, requiring such treatment had been blocked. So uh, you see here uh, the immorality of it, but not only the immorality of it, uh, there is personal criminal liability uh, for the impact of these sanctions. Absolutely criminal liability, not just in Venezuela, but everywhere else they've done it, right? That's an absolutely amazing soundbite there from a United Nations investigator telling the truth about what has been done to the sovereign state of Venezuela through sanctions to destroy the country, to blame it on the elected, democratically elected leader of the same. And he sums it up nicely here in less than a minute. You've heard three minutes. Hear this little summing up. Alfred uh, Dezeus, UN investigator, the first one to visit Venezuela in over 20 years, brought to you courtesy of Abby Martin. And this is his summing up here of what's happened. And this is powerful stuff, this. What the United States intended to do was to create a situation whereby the people or the military uh, would topple the government and then uh, the one percent uh, could again come in and could again control the wealth uh, of Venezuela. Venezuela had succeeded in uh, bringing uh, millions and millions of Venezuelans out of extreme poverty. Nobody cared in the 1980s and 90s that there were millions of Venezuelans dying of hunger and malnutrition. No one cared. It's, it, it was a government that was palatable to Washington and a government that was a right-wing government. The moment that a left-wing government came in power, uh, priority number one in Washington was to topple it. Priority number one was to topple it. Ah, and that's the truth about Venezuela and what's happening there now. The time is approaching 25 minutes past the hour. And that's about all I've got time for today, dear friends. Thanks so much for uh, listening today, for being there, for tweeting. Massive amount of tweets there. If I didn't give you a mention, it was for no other reason than there's been so many tweets. Hi to Paul Paranite. How you doing, Paul? I'm scrolling right down now to the ones that came in very early. Hi to William Henderson. How you doing, William? Uh, as well uh, anybody that I didn't say hello to today do not think it's a slight it is not just uh, as I said so many came in hi to Tiger as well how you doing Tiger uh, a lot of you still giggling away about this Yorkshire friends of Israel yeah Faisal is a very smart guy I, I know this because I read his tweets and I I've heard him contribute to the phone-ins 
he just got caught. He, he jumped in with two feet. I've done it myself. I've done it myself so many times. I, I certainly can't laugh or throw stones at that particular glass house. But uh, yeah, it's a hoax account. No doubt about that. 26 minutes then past the air. Thanks for listening to it. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back with you tomorrow. I will have guests with me. Uh, 5 p.m. as usual. Tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. Sunday View live every Sunday morning at 11 as usual. Your Richie Allen show is back and I can't tell you how happy I am that it is because I really missed you. I really did. Now you enjoy the rest of your Monday. We're all going mad with the sunshine. We're all going mad, I tells you. Going to close out with Steve Earl. I love you. Thanks for listening. I'm Richie Allen. Speak tomorrow at five. Until then, look after yourselves and one another. Bye now.